just making sure it's recorded because Lisa and I did one it is Lisa and I did one last week an hour and a half and neither of us press record <laughs> <laughs> nightmare okay hi today I'm going to be talking to Mark Stephen Pooler who's an author and an inspirational speaker his book's called The Tips to Create the Life You Desire. Mark wrote the book about his life um, with severe bullying and how he, how he overcame that. Um, Mark, welcome. Hi Deborah, great to be here. Good to see you. Can you tell us about why and how you started, you know, you thought about writing your book, your story of your life? When I joined into speaking, obviously I had the story of bullying and addiction and I really wanted to get my message out there to people and I thought what better way than getting it onto paper. So I decided to start to write my book and it took me a year in total to get it into paper and it was just purely to help and inspire people. And actually, I found, I found it really therapeutic, actually writing the book. It was actually like therapy, like going through all the emotions. So not only was it to help other people, I felt like writing it, getting those emotions out, really helped me too. Yeah. Well, the stories, I've read the book and it, it's, it had me in tears at points um, and oh, smiling no. at others. But it's um, very gritty and, um, and it's you know, a real truthful, um, you know, heart-wrenching at times story. But you suffered terrible bullying, didn't you, at school? I did. Right from primary school, I, I always knew I was different. I didn't have many friends. If I did have friends, they were girls. And the bullying started very, very young. I would say a couple of weeks into primary school. And... It was things like big chin, big ears, gay, puff. And at the time, I didn't know my own sexuality. I was thinking, why are they calling me that? I didn't even know what it meant. And that was really, really hard, having to go and take that in school every day, not knowing what they were calling you when you're getting called a puff. That was really, really hard. And as time passed, it got a little bit worse as well, like being pushed around on, in the playground or on the playing field. So it was a very, very lonely time. Primary school and secondary school got a lot, lot worse. And that eventually, that, that long, tortuous bullying um, actually manifested it into you becoming an adult, an addict to drugs. It, it really did, yes. I felt like at, at primary school I went through bullying. I purposely chose the secondary school that no one else had gone to from primary school. And after a few weeks, the bullying started so my insecurities, my self-esteem, my self-confidence was really, really low. I, I really didn't concentrate in school. I started to play up and be naughty just to make people laugh, just to calm the bullying down. And I started going out clubbing when I was 15 years old. And that was when my journey into drug taking started. And it was all due to low self-esteem and not having a direction from my future. And it did all stem from my childhood and being bullied. So the drug, so your drug of choice was ecstasy to start with, ecstasy. was it? It started on soft drugs like tamazepam, diazepam, speed, cannabis, ecstasy. And as time passed, it got to the more heavy drugs where I started to take crack cocaine and heroin. That's, that's unbelievable. Um, it breaks my heart listening to you now, but I'm also totally inspired by how you overcame it. The drugs though, did they make you feel, um, I'm getting emotional because I can feel your pain. Oh, I, can, yeah. I, I can feel it for you, but um, you, did that give you a high that made you feel good because you felt so low from all the constant bullying and the name calling and the physical violence 
did the drugs give you sort of a high? You know, I, I mean, obviously they gave you a high, but did they make you feel good about yourself? Is that why you got hooked into it? Yes. When I started going out clubbing or partying, the party drugs make you feel amazing when you're on them. And I would do it because... I could just be myself. I would talk to people. I, I, because of my low self-esteem, I was very uncomfortable talking to people and just being myself. So the drugs let me become myself. I would just be myself. And obviously, as time goes on, you do get an eye off the drugs, but you get a really bad low. And over time, your body starts to suffer I lost lots of weight. I got headaches. I would shake. If I'd been out clubbing all weekend, I used to get the shakes. So my health did start to deteriorate. From about the age of 18, I would start to phone in sick at work. But you do get the eye off the drugs, and it was just a weekend thing. Mm -hmm. But as I got into the heavier drugs... I wouldn't even say it was about the eye. It was more about the addiction. Mm -hmm. Once you take crack cocaine or you take heroin, once you have had that hit and that high, you just want more and you just want more. And I remember I was at my mum's house at the time in, a, in my bedroom. I would sell like my little portable television out of the bedroom just to go and get more crack cocaine. So, yeah, you do get the high, but the low is really not worth it. And, yeah, you do get the high, you get the low. But when you're on the heavier drugs, it's purely the addiction. You just want more and more and more. I mean, as, a, as an ex-food addict, it's not quite the same, but, but I also, um, up until a year ago, myself was addicted to um, tramadol. Yes, I've heard of that. Right, so that's a, a very strong painkiller, and I was taking up to eight a day. Um, so it's not on the same lines as you, but I understand addiction. And, and I've Any suffered. addiction is an addiction at the yeah. end of the day. They're, they're, they're all from the mind and... Any addiction, whether it's food, even sugar is an addiction. Yeah. You know, it's all about the mind, isn't it, Deborah? But yeah, yeah it's not. It's nice. the oblivion for, for me with food, and then eventually with the painkillers. It was it was a uh, to feel oblivion. So you're saying it was to feel yourself, so you could feel yourself and not have to, you know, to just be accepting of yourself and not be uncomfortable. Uh, yes. the same for me it was to, to feel that oblivion just just not to have to be in my own head and worried about being a certain way and not being accepted whatever it was it, it it's just that moment to take you out of it food's obviously a, a lot shorter ride if you like because you know as soon as you've eaten it eaten, you've had a binge then you start feeling guilty so it's, it's a shorter just... It's a vicious circle, isn't it, Deborah? Because you take the drug or the, or the food to, to give you that feel good or to make you feel a little bit happier or to make you feel high. But as soon as that drug wears off or as soon as you've ate that food, you're right back down there. So you have to go back and it's like just that vicious circle then. Yeah. And that's why it's an addiction. Tell me when you realised that you'd hit rock bottom, this is a really interesting part of your book. Tell me when you think, when you actually knew, right, okay. I think rock bottom, I've hit it a few times in my life. And there is only one way to go when you hit rock bottom. Sometimes you have to hit rock bottom to build yourself back up. But... I would say rock bottom for me was being on my hands and knees in my mom in in my bedroom at my mum's house, picking up fluff off the carpet, thinking it was a crack rock that I've dropped. And then real rock bottom was where I'd been out partying with friends and I took a new clubbing drug called GHB. One minute having the time of my life. And the next minute, I woke up in hospital. I'd just collapsed and I'd died. And I'd got bruises all up my arm where adrenaline had been pumped into me. My chest was all shaven, where shock pads had been used on me to bring me back to life. 
and that really was rock bottom actually collapsing and dying and I'm so fortunate to have been given a second chance at life because I could have so easily have just that could have been the end for me but this is what astounds me about that story that should have been your wake up moment but what did you do when you left hospital I went straight back out partying and I carried on taking ecstasy and I'd still got all the sticky pads from my, on my chest from the hospital and I carried on drug taking. But a few days after that, I was in my bedroom because I still live with my mum at the time. And my mum caught me in my bedroom taking crack cocaine and she came into the bedroom, grabbed the crack pipe off me ran outside with it and chucked it down the drain and she did one of the best things she could have ever done for me Deborah and she chucked me out of the family home straight away I moved away from the area I moved away from all my associations that I was hanging around with that were dragging me down and I give up crack and heroin straight away no medical help from the doctor just purely from using the power of my mind. I, I did go through pain. I had to cold turkey, go through the hot and cold shivers. But I knew I had to change my life. And you did. And you've just done an absolutely amazing job. And you're an inspiration to everybody. I'm getting upset again because it's just, it's such a, it's a, it's such a wonderful story. And, and then you've turned that right round now to help other people. And not only have you written this brilliant book, which is, you know, part of it is about your story. And then the rest of it is about how, you know, your suggested tips for people to make a better life for themselves. So, you know, helping so many people. And also you're, you're a, you're a speaker now. Yes, I'm a motivational speaker. That's going amazing. And I absolutely love it. And I love the feedback when people come and say that was really inspirational. You've given me hope for the future. And I wrote the book Tips to Create the Life You Desire. One, because I knew I had a great story with really big lessons, what I've learned in life. And some really embarrassing moments of my life as well that I really didn't want to share, but I shared them in hope to help people. I think people who've read the book actually can't believe the kind of life I've lived. And I really wanted to make it sort of a bit biography at the beginning and share everything of my life. And then I wanted a second part of the book to give people tips and strategies of how to move forward in business and in life. And it's a really honest book. And even though there's some sad parts of the book, it's not written in a way where you would feel sorry for or it's not to make you feel down. The book is a real uplifting book to bring happiness. It is. I think it's the, the reason that it made me cry in parts and laugh in others is that, it's empathy you know I may not have been on those uh, on crack cocaine but I have had my times where I turned to other things all sorts of bloody things to you know to to get through and so it, it was empathy knowing how you felt in that moment and then knowing how you must have felt when your mum threw you out even though it was the best thing that she could have done for you and that's real lo tough love well, at the time, I say it was the best thing now, at the time, it was the worst thing because up until that point, I was a bit of a mommy's boy, I suppose, everything done for me. Um, I thought I knew everything. I had a bad attitude and all of a sudden, enough's enough, you get kicked out, you have to get your first flat and you're like, okay, I'm on my own now. I've got to look after myself. That was a big, big wake-up call for me, having to go from having everything to having to look after myself. But I would have never have grown up if that hadn't have happened. And it was the best thing she could have ever have done for me. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Do you know what? It's been an absolute joy talking to you. And I will be putting some information up about your book and the links 
um, so that people can actually read your your amazing story. But I appreciate you being, you know, telling me and opening up to me today, and it and it's been wonderful. So thank you so much. Bless your heart. Thank you so much for having me, Deborah. I'm so glad I've met you as well. We get on brilliant, and I'm looking forward to our our friendship becoming more as well. Me too, sweetie. Me too. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Take care, Deborah. Bye, lovely.